There is a completely different football team going to be playing in Seattle this season and in a different conference. Of course, we're talking about the Huskies and we got Lars Hansen on the line from Locked On Huskies podcast. So please join him right there and we will give you some further details. Please like the video and subscribe here at the Voice of College Football. Lars, good to see you. So this is the one team that I have made the go to comment uh a number of times during the off season that it is got to be unprecedented that you've got a new coach, new coaching staff, this many new starters, a new quarterback and the caveat, of course, the new conference too. So you put all that into play and it's got to be unprecedented in the history of college football. So we got to get acquainted with this team, but I, I guess first and foremost is there's at least a quarterback that college football fans should be extremely familiar with because he's been prolific in the record books. And uh, if he turns in an average Will Rogers season, he's going to figure prominently uh, at uh, near the top of uh, career leadership across the board. Uh, I don't necessarily know that Jed Fish can pick, uh, is too concerned about that. Yeah, obviously losing Michael Penix, the, the, the question is who's going to you know be delivering the passes. And I think the caveat for Washington, having an experienced quarterback does kind of changed the trajectory a little bit because the other two quarterbacks, Shaker Kendall, a redshirt freshman from Northern Colorado, and DeMond Williams, a four-star true freshman. If either of those two other guys are your option, you're looking at a four, five, six win season at best. With Will Rogers, there's a little bit of veteran, there's not a little bit, there's certainly a significant amount of veteran presence there. The question for me is, is going to become who's going to protect Will, who's going to open the running lanes, because well, you can have a very good experienced season quarterback in Will Rogers, who obviously set the SEC record for passing guards and, and all that is for Mississippi State. But if you don't have an offensive line or even some semblance of an offensive line, and to be clear, obviously Washington did win the Joe Moore Award last season for the nation's best offensive line. Three of those guys are in the NFL, and two of them are now with Lane Kiffin and Ole Miss. So there's going to be a significant – just. You talked about the unprecedented, just unprecedented alone on the offensive side, losing your entire starting offensive line. There are only a couple of guys returning to the team from the offensive line, and once guard Memolara left guard, who tore his ACL during fall camp last year, was expected to be a contributor last fall along the offensive line, probably as a, as a backup, but would certainly have seen some game time last season. The other one is Landon Hatchett, who did play last season and then suffered a similar injury in the lead up to the uh, Sugar Bowl against Texas. So he's been out for the last seven months, six, seven, eight months now. He didn't practice in the spring. Guard was able to practice a little bit. The rest of the offensive line, a former Maryland offensive tackle who hasn't played football in at least 18 months, a, a center from Portland State who, albeit has had a significant amount of experience, is coming up from the FCS level. So there's you know, to be proven there, especially at the Big Ten level. And Nook from my high from Ohio State comes over. I've heard mixed reviews on his time in Columbus. I know, obviously, he did get a chance to start, I believe, one or two games maybe, but certainly in his four or five seasons in Columbus didn't necessarily vault himself into being a starter for the Buckeyes, so there's a little bit of question there. The most proven offensive lineman is Drew as a party, the right tackle from San Diego State. But when four of your five offensive linemen are question marks and just respectfully to the players and coaches going in, there's a lot left to be proven between now and even when we kick off at the end of, in the end of August against Weaver State. Now, there were certainly uh, thoughts and hopes by Husky fans that Jed Fish would bring some of the best talent with him from Arizona. Uh, that didn't necessarily come to fruition, although Jonah Coleman, one of the best backs in the Pac-12, did make that decision yes he did i do think you know obviously no doubt you would love to have Noah Fafita and tetra mcmillan and the receiver quarterback combination but when you have will rogers you can kind of work around that the one thing that washington didn't have a lot of was a stable didn't really have anything that was running back so bringing in jonah coleman who had over 800 yards and a couple and a few touchdowns in arizona last season working with a couple of different backs he is no doubt going to be the back of washington i talked to a number of recruits who have taken visits and even transfer commits who have come onto the program in the last couple of months everybody describes jonah coleman without his name and says oh washington star running back he just has an aura about him he has a and when you mix him with scotty graham where those two coming up from Arizona, it really seems like Scotty Graham is somebody who believes highly in Jonah Coleman. And PFF, I, PFF, I know, graded Jonah Coleman as, I believe, the number one or number two running back coming back in the country. So I think without question, there's something there. 
but the problem becomes behind Jonah Coleman. You have Cam Davis, who did have double-digit touchdowns in 2022 behind Wayne Talapapa, but had a torn ACL last season, did not play at all. And then we're talking about Sam Adams, a, a junior who hasn't done much after coming out of you know staying in Washington in 2020. Adam Muhammad, I think, could be actually a serviceable back, but he's a true freshman. Jordan Washington, another true freshman. So Jonah Coleman really is going to be the guy that's carrying the load, which to me is good and bad because Jonah Coleman, I agree, is going to be a capable back. But especially in the Big Ten, you need two, three, and four running backs to offset. And so Jonah Coleman doesn't have to take all the pounding because especially against teams like Michigan, Northwest, you're just tough, those tougher teams that you're going to face in the Big Ten than maybe Washington and Arizona haven't been used to in the Pac-12 over the past couple of seasons. That, to me, is where you could get concerned because if you lose Jonah Coleman, that running back room does not look friendly at all, at least for 2024 and 25 and 26. I like the talent there in terms of the young talent in the room, but I know I know Jed Fish loves to play freshman, but if you're looking at Jordan Washington, Adam Muhammad, and you know half of Cam Davis, that, that's a lot less appealing than having Jonah Coleman and Revolve Cam Davis and a couple of freshmen you can mix in to sprinkle and spread out the carries. So you talk about losing Jonah Coleman and the team being in an issue with the running back room. What about if Will Rogers goes down? So here's where I'm bullish on that because Will Rogers did only play six games last season at Mississippi State. So there is precedence if he doesn't play a full season. But one thing for me with that, with Will Rogers electing to stay at Washington after the coaching change, because he did commit to Kalen DeBoer and Ryan Grubb in December before the national championship game. Had a conversation with Jed Fish, elected to stay on and play for him at Washington because he only has one year left. They really like what they have in DeMond Williams. And I don't want to put too high of an expectation bar on him, but I've already said on Locked On, I'm going to have a story coming out actually later today on Athlon Sports, where I would not be surprised if DeMond plays more than five games this season. Now, in terms of starting, I don't believe it, but I would not be surprised if Washington finds a few packages for DeMond because he is a special dual threat quarterback. He, he the the amount of zip that he has as a true freshman with his vision, and he doesn't just fire it in there into double and triple coverage. He actually is almost like a redshirt freshman in that regard, but he comes in with so much experience having played at Basha High School in Arizona. Only lost, I think, two or three games over his entire starting career in Arizona at the high school ranks. So to me, Jed Fish loved what he was bringing in at Arizona. They brought him with him. They brought they brought Desmond uh, Demond up to Washington with the new staff, and to me, I think if Will Rogers doesn't end up starting the season, doesn't start every single game this season, while it's not the greatest scenario, I don't think there's that much of a fall off overall because I think Demond can make it up with his legs. It won't look as pretty, you might, but what we saw from Arizona when Jed Fish had to turn to Noah Fafita last season, it was a similar question where you have um, Jane Delora, you think he's the better veteran but you put in this younger player and there's not much of a drop off. And I don't, I obviously want to respect Will Rogers because of the passing acumen that he has, but DeMond's dual ability, I think offsets a little bit of that. So I wouldn't necessarily be as concerned, but with respect to that, that's probably meaning you're losing two or three games that Will would win those for you. If he would. Yeah, it definitely sets up as a difficult season for Husky fans to take in after uh, a national championship game run. And then whatever this is going to be, I would think it's a transition year. Let's get to six wins, get to a bowl game, make it not look too ugly and uh, make our entry into the big 10 and then set ourselves up for better things. And hopefully, and I know you in particular, will be looking at uh, especially the younger players on the team to see who's developing, who sets up, as an impact guy or an all conference type of player the next year, which leads me to wide receiver, uh, which was one of the best groups in college football last year. So they're all gone. Uh, really uh, serious college football fans will know about Jeremiah Hunter out of Cal. Uh, he was one of their top receivers, was their top receiver for two consecutive years. So he seems to be the leader of the group. Uh, what do we know about uh, these wide receivers top to bottom? So you're not wrong in terms of if you ask everybody outside the state of Washington who the best receiver is coming in, they would say Jeremiah Hunter. The answer for me is Desmond uh, um, um, Denzel Boston. Sorry, I had to get that one out of the way because actually who, um, Michael Banks called him Denzel Washington last year. But uh, Denzel was a player who had it not been for either Jalen McMillan or Jalen Polk last season, he's taking those reps, and I would not 
he, they might not have the same exact numbers, but at 6'4", 209, um, Denzel can really high point the ball. He showed great last fall camp, last spring camp, this spring camp as well. So I think he's actually going to be the A1 receiver. Jeremiah will be the basketball target destination, if you will, in terms of the end zone target. Might have 10 plus touchdowns, but only have 40 or 50 catches. In a passing heavy offense, that might not seem like a ton, but you're really going for touchdowns and production in that respect versus the total yardage, which is where I think Denzel is going to lead the team in all three categories at the end of the season. I, I said that back in the spring just because he has all those traits and was able to learn from those three guys the past two seasons. He would have played a lot. He would have played the last couple of seasons, in my opinion, if you didn't have those three great receivers at Washington. Talking Huskies, and of course, Washington made it all the way to the National Championship as Pac-12 champions last year. Much different look this year. Uh, the most egregious uh, difference in personnel between one team and another from 23 to 24. We got Lars Hansen here to break it down. You can catch Lars' work on Locked on Huskies, also UW Fan Nation. So, Lars, when we look at the defense, uh, again, total, total overhaul for the most part. Uh, what are the familiar spots, if any, and then uh, take us on to the newcomers? I think of the two sides of the ball, the defense is the one with the most question marks because when you look at the offense, you know what Jed Fish is going to run at the college level. We've been able to see that Arizona. The biggest question mark in college football is going to be what does a Steve Belichick defense look like? with college players so you don't have the NFL pedigree and you don't have your dad actually, you know, being the overarcher one and getting all the credit for it. What we've seen this past, what we saw during spring camp was really interesting. There was a couple of players. I don't want to, I'll, I'll use one as an example. Isaiah Ward, he's a redshirt freshman, sophomore, whatever you want to call him classification wise, two year second player. It was an edge rusher at Arizona lined up interior at edge, and I want to say a nickel. It was like a weird, like a wide 18. It's like, you know, the wide nine edge rusher position times two it was more like a half nickel, half wide nine. I have a lot of questions in a positive right about what Steve Belichick will do this season because there's so much unproven talent where you're looking at the defensive line is replacing all five starters as well. Braylon Trice is gone. Zion Tupelo Fatui is gone. Your three interior highest rated guys are gone. And to, um, Tula, 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 Gassanoa, Fatu, Tuatele, and MJLA. The guys that they have brought in in a similar realm, you're looking at Deshaun, War Deshaun Lynch from Sacramento State. Zach Durfee is now going to be the edge rusher coming from the University of Sioux Falls. There's a lot of guys where you're looking and saying, nobody is proven, but man, if all of these guys pop and you work with the NFL scheme that Steve Belichick is bringing, this could be a very promising defense. The only caveat there is, most of these guys either haven't started or haven't even played as much. And Zach Durfee only got two games last season because the NCAA said you couldn't transfer twice. That's a separate issue because Durfee was actually a student in North Dakota State his first time around, so it shouldn't even have been a two-time transfer. But that's beside the point. Look at the other guys. You know, the only two proven guys coming back that actually played at Washington are Carson Bruner and Alfonso Tupatal, two linebackers. They bring in Ephesians Prysock from Arizona, the other cornerback opposite to Cario Davis last season. He did. He looked like he's going to be able to hold his own. You got a tall 6'3 cornerback there. The problem is the similar with last season. You had Jabbar Muhammad on one side. You could He could hold his own. But you had Thaddeus Dixon, Eliza Jackson, the who's who of who in terms of can you actually find a second cornerback that can prove to be a lockdown guy game in and game out, or if anything, just be able to start for 12 games I like um, Thaddeus' physicality, but he is kind of a boom or bust guy in terms of he's either going to be all in or get beat completely. Elijah Jackson obviously showed, you know, with winning the uh, Sugar Bowl against Adela Mitchell that he can perform in key moments, but we did see him get beat a couple of times last season as well. John Richardson is going to be a phenomenal coach. Reminds me a lot of a young Jimmy Lake before he got promoted and went down the rabbit hole that he went down. John Richardson's been able to develop quarterbacks pretty much everywhere he's been, from Wyoming to Washington State to now Arizona and Washington. I think they're going to be much improved in that regard. Where it comes into question again is the safeties. This, this Steve Belichick's defense is predicated upon the defense, the secondary having too high safety, so you can leave the corners on an island. You're coming in with Cam Fabiculani, who played a majority of last season but didn't start in front of Asa Turner. 
and one of Canberra Star, the Sac State transfer, All American for a first team, uh, Big Sky last season. All these guys trying to level up. Will they actually be able to do that? And especially at the Big Ten level, it r- remains to be seen. You like the talent and the size and the projectability, all these favorite buzzwords that media people and you know pundits like to use, but nothing proven. And for me, I will be really curious to see how much of these guys that they brought in in the spring transfer window actually end up starting. Because I think Justin Harrington and Cameron Sarr are going to be two of the guys that start week one against Weaver State and carry on through the entire season and nickel and safety, respectively. That will solve a lot of problems if they can play up to the potential that they did. The problem was Justin Harrington has never been able to stay healthy for a full season since playing at JUCO back in 2019-2020. Went to Oklahoma, was going to start last season until he tore his ACL, I believe, in week two or three. So there's so many. You have about five or six guys on this team that could be starters coming off ACL injuries. You want, we could talk about unprecedented. I can't think of a team that went to a national championship or even that played in a major bowl game that returned the next season banking on five guys with ACL injuries. Now, I, I'm not saying that that's the end-all be-all, but it just really puts into context how crazy that this season could be in a good and bad sense. You could win eight or nine, or you could win four. And there's a lot in between there that'll dictate – you know, does Will Rogers start every game? That's probably two or three more wins. And now you're at six. Does Harrington pop? Does Sebastian Valve as a defensive lineman pop? And it's one of the starters that left. There's so many guys that are in position to do it. But the problem is, given that Steve Belichick has never called a, def- a, a game as a college DC, I'm willing to give him the benefit of the doubt based on his last name. But like everything in sports, you still got to prove it. And to me, we didn't necessarily see enough in the spring, no surprise, to say, oh, this is what Steve's going to do in the fall. Or this is why I would be optimistic about Washington's defense. You gave them the benefit of the doubt because they've been able to get some guys in, but I'm not necessarily ready to say this is a top five or even top 10 defense in the Big Ten. It could certainly prove to be that, but I don't think anybody realistically is going to say going into the season, yeah, this is a top team. On, both, on either side of the ball, to be frank. It is the mystery team of the Big Ten, the mystery team of college football. Let's uh, put it out like that. Uh, it's the Washington Huskies. we got Lars Hansen on here from UW Fan Nation. Locked on Huskies. Catch the podcast with Lars. You see all of his information there on the banner. Uh, it seems to be a tendency of coaches in general, college football coaches in particular, Lars, that if they have a highly touted team, then they talk them down. I think they're trying to send a message through the media. Okay, you're not as good as you think you are. you got to keep working. Nose to the grindstone. If they've got a bad team or a team that in this situation would be, of course, given far less expectations than the previous two editions, then they tend to talk them up because they want to bolster their confidence and tell them that they're, they, can, they can do more. So um, taking in Jed Fish's rhetoric this offseason – uh, where does he seem to be? I don't want to chicken out on this answer, but really somewhere in the middle. The only guys that he has talked about have been the guys that came from Arizona or Will Rogers, the guys that you could easily say, hey, you know what? We know what Jonah Coleman's going to be. He's going to be a special back. Okay, Jed can make that comparison and knowing what he did in Arizona. Will, you can talk about Will Rogers and everything he did at the SEC, but everything else, I mean, I remember he was on with um, a local radio station a couple of weeks ago, uh, KJR in Seattle, he didn't mention really anybody along the offensive line in terms of transfers. Now, again, the, the, for full context, the station is a partner of the school radio affiliate. So he's not going to get the most hardest hitting questions. I'm just going to be honest about that. So when I get to talk to him at Big Ten Media Day here in a couple of weeks in Indianapolis, one of the first three or four questions is going to be, okay, aside from the guys that you have talked about, who are you going to talk about a month from now when you're getting ready to set those two deeps? And I think to answer your question in that regard, he had he had let it kind of sit where he said, we're going to bring these guys in, but I'm not going to talk about them and I'm going to let them figure it out in a, you know, kind of every coach seems to be in that CEO mold of, you know what, I'm going to kind of just be a little more hands off. Kalen DeBoer was in that same realm as well. And in that regard, I do think Jed's basically saying with that, we should be six and six. We could be eight and four. I'm certainly not going to say that we're, hey, this is a rebuilding year because to, to answer your question directly, he has not said that. He's, we've all said transition year. We've all said, you know, expectations should be limited. 
but this fan base did still go to a national championship last season, albeit with a roster that's completely different. So the fans know, hey, you should still win. You should still get to a bowl game. You should still be in that six to eight win mold. But if you don't win 10, we're not going to be surprised, especially when you look at who they were able to get in the transfer portal. They didn't go out and get a bunch of proven starters with Power 5 experience or even Big 10 experience. And the ones that did come from the Big 10 don't have experience. And that's respectfully saying that. So you can get all these guys that you want in the boat, but he hasn't gone out of his way to say, you know what, let's temper expectations, let's pump up expectations. I think he's kind of just letting it sit and – in reality, no one's talking about Washington in a positive or negative light. Everyone asking the same questions that we, you know, we're talking about here, which is what is Washington? Who is this Washington team? Obviously, they went to the national championship last season. Are they going to be 2022-23 TCU? Or are they going to be a team that can actually rebound and potentially win eight or nine games and then set yourself up for 2025 to still get back to that 10-win plateau? Because to me – with the tools that Jed Fish has at Washington, he should win 10 games in year two and year three. Year one, he gets the benefit of the doubt, especially with the roster turnover. But there's enough talent on this team where with the right coaching, and I think that's where Jed has succeeded in that regard. He's brought in some great X's and O's coaches. The recruiters have also kind of been able to do their things. So there isn't a coach to me that I look at on the staff and say, oh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sold on his acumen. There's some guys that I think will be proven, and Steve Belichick is one of them. But all the pieces are there to have an okay season, and I think that's kind of where Jed's at. He's not going out of his way to speak it up. He's not going out of his way to speak it down. The interesting thing for me is Washington player-wise has been completely absent on preseason awards list. You know, Phil Steele, Lindsey, whichever one you want to look at. I haven't found a single Washington player. I know there's a couple that, you know, Carson Burn has made an appearance and Jonah Coleman's gotten the tip of the cap, but nobody is saying, hey, this guy could lead Washington or these guys are going to be the ones to watch at Washington. I don't think anybody knows. And to me, if you're Washington, that's kind of where they entered the 2022 season where there was some talent on the team, but nobody thought they were going to win 10, 11, 12, 10, 10 games that season. Some of us did, but not everybody. Much like last season, I said Washington would go 14 and 1. Not a lot of people did, so I can see them going eight and four, but it's there's a lot still to be sorted out, and I know that's not the cleanest answer, but that's just where the program is at. Lars Hansen, Locked On Huskies, also UW Fan Nation, break down Washington football for us. Lars, as always, appreciate you stopping by. 